Let's finish by talking about the future of NATO. A lot of this we've already alluded to, by the way. NATO's mission is first and foremost the biggest thing that's changed into the modern era. Again, the U.S. was always and has still been the coalition leader of this group, taking charge of killing commies. But now, now that the Cold War is over, the U.S. is kind of leading the charge in the war on terrorism. That's right. And that's the major shift I want you to know. There ain't no more commies. There's no ideological threat from that. It's been shifted to tackle the whole world terrorism issue. You can see this first and foremost in the current NATO Afghan campaign. And yes, I said NATO Afghan war. This is a NATO war. I know, I know, I know. That's very confusing to a lot of people in the world, probably in your country and even in Afghanistan, because everybody thinks it's a U.S. war. No, it's not. NATO war. Again, September 11th, 2001, U.S. attacked, goes to NATO and says, we've been attacked. The bad guys are in Afghanistan. Rally the troops. NATO did. That's why it is a coal a NATO coalition war in Afghanistan. It's a NATO war, not a singular U.S. war. It looks like a U.S. war because the U.S. provides most of the troops, overwhelmingly provides most of the troops, and most of the money, and most of the military hardware. But there's Frenchies there, there's British guys there, there's Germans there. And NATO members all contribute to the kitty to fight the war. It's a NATO campaign reflecting its shifted mission here in the 21st century. That's important to note, by the way, because that's a never-ending mission. Now NATO can go on in perpetuity because there's never going to be an end to the war on terror. And any time a European country or the U.S. or Canada, any NATO member, has a terrorist attack on their soil, you could make the case that we're going to start another NATO war if you can then go isolate where the people are that you want to go get. Huh? Huh? That's why it's important to understand this stuff. Uh, point two, future of NATO. Uh, the increasing voice of Russia. Yeah. Is Russia working towards inclusion in NATO? I mean, Russia already is invited to the meetings. They actually have a kind of a sub-meeting. Uh, there's yearly conferences, and actually NATO heads get together even more than once a year, but there's one big meeting every year. NATO countries get together to talk about operations and stuff, and invariably, that day or the next day, there'll be a side meeting, a NATO-Russia meeting. And that should make sense, by the way. Yes, they were the adversary of NATO during the Cold War, but the Cold War is done. And really, it's in NATO's best interest, the U.S.'s interest in particular, to not piss off the Ruskies, to not accidentally be having a NATO war training mission that you don't tell Russia about, that they don't know about, and you accidentally start World War III. So it makes a little bit of sense. And it actually was assumed, just after the demise of the Soviet Union in 1991, that Russia might be invited to join outright. Think about it. Russia does have a lot in common with Team West. I, not just ethnically and linguistically, but historically. And so there was a certain logic that, well, let's just let them join. And wow, think about that. What a ginormously kick-ass institute NATO would be if you had the Ruskies on board. If you got the Ruskies in NATO, that would be about 95% of the world's nuclear arsenal under one umbrella. Who the hell would ever mess with anybody basically in the Northern Hemisphere if Russia were to join NATO? However, um, I don't look for it to happen. They will continue to be folded in more into NATO operations in terms of being consulted. They will be working, I believe, a lot more with NATO in active missions. And you heard it here first. They're going to start helping with the Afghanistan mission. It's in Russia's strategic interest to do so anyway. They might as well. Hell, the Ruskies fought a war in Afghanistan already. They lost, but they know the territory a little bit better than NATO operations do. And it's in their interest because a lot of the heroin produced in Afghanistan actually makes it to Russia. So Russia and the surrounding countries, by the way, have a vested interest in Afghanistan getting fixed and not falling into utter chaos 
and a major heroin producer on the planet. So look for Russia to help with NATO operations in Afghanistan and possibly, possibly future other NATO missions. But don't look for them to actually join. They, in their strategic interest, should be outsiders. They are friends with the Chinese. They are friends with Iran. They are friends with lots of other entities that NATO countries don't particularly like. So they don't want to get embroiled. They don't want to join a club that they're going to have to go stick up for somebody who's going to go attack a friend of theirs, say, like Iran. So don't look for them to join, but look for them to have an increasing uh, consultations with NATO and helping out in their active missions. By the way, Russia's been much more conciliatory towards not just NATO expansion, but perhaps even the missile shield since the U.S. said, you know what, we're going to give it up. We don't want to piss off the Russians and NATO. We don't, you know, come on, NATO countries. We don't want to piss off the Russians. We have got other fish to fry. We're worried about Iran and North Korea and these other entities. Let's not piss off the Ruskies. And the Ruskies have been paying attention to that. So you might even see a rejuvenation of the missile shield that Russia is a part of. Ah, that would, that would help soften the whole thing if, if it doesn't look like it's being set up to attack the Russians. They can't be attacked if they're part of it. <laughs> so look for future Russian involvement in NATO, but not membership. Okay, well, who would be future potential members of NATO then? Is it done growing? Uh, judgment call here by Sergeant Boyer. Yes, it probably is at its end game of expansion, but you never know. There are actually a handful of countries which are slated already to be joining the NATO group. And those are the states of the former Yugoslavia. All those little places like Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Croatia, and Montenegro. They're supposed to join, but let's be brutally honest. They're small, dink little countries with small, dink little militaries. They're not going to make that big of an impact whether they join NATO or not. Quite frankly, they're probably being invited to join to head off future conflicts with each other. Not that there's going to be any serious threat posed from the outside. Really a kind of consolidating Europe type of affair by inviting those guys to join. But there are other places, more important places in Europe, that probably are not going to join. Because Ukraine and Georgia were on the track to join. But as already pointed out, this really pissed off the Russians and they kind of counterattacked uh, both by setting up different defense strategies, by pointing missiles at these places, but also economically by cutting off oil and natural gas strategically to these places. So a rejuvenated Russia can put a lot of leverage on these countries to not join. They can actually put a lot of leverage on NATO to stop asking these countries to join. And the likelihood of Ukraine or Georgia joining NATO gets increasingly slim as every day goes by. Even if Russia becomes very friendly with NATO, look for them to continue to say, no, 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 yet, yet, yet. Do not let Ukraine in. Do not let Georgia in. These are countries which directly border us. Strategically, it offends us. Strategically, it makes us worry. And if you truly want to be a friend of the Russians, don't make us worry. You wouldn't like us when we're worried. We do bad things when we're worried, like invade Georgia. <laughs> Sorry to my Rusky friends, but I had to throw that in there. So that actually may be the price of Russian cooperation, is that Ukraine and Georgia are kind of just not pushed off to the side, but they're going to let the NATO membership drop with those countries because they don't want to offend Russia. It's going to be the price of Russian cooperation. However, I think this is something that not a lot of folks are talking about that has much more likelihood of happening. And that is there may be other NATO members, which or other countries which may become NATO members. Quite frankly, they probably should be already because they're staunch allies of the US and all NATO countries. And logically, they should probably already be in it. Who am I talking about here? I'm talking about the other countries who are part of Team West, but not NATO members. Countries like ah, Japan or Australia or perhaps even South Korea. These are all countries that if they were ever attacked by anybody, almost with no reservations, NATO would probably come help them. The U.S. certainly would. But the NATO, other NATO countries probably would come help Japan or Australia or South Korea. So why not just make it official and let them in? I think that's a much higher likelihood of those countries joining than any further expansion in Eastern Europe up to Russia's borders. And I do want to kind of jot this down here as well in your notes. 
The other main reason that Russia really is adamant about Ukraine not joining is because this little stretch of territory called the Crimean Peninsula. There it is, zooming in on the map. The Crimean Peninsula is a, of strategic interest to Russia in an extremely big way. Why? Because a big portion of Russia's naval services are located in the Crimean Peninsula. That's right, the Russian Navy is there. How could that be? How could the Russian Navy be in another sovereign state country named Ukraine? Because the Ukraine used to be part of the Soviet Union. It was the Ukrainian SSR, part of the USSR. So the, the naval establishments, the naval ports, the naval facilities that were built up there were built up there during the Soviet era uh, by the Russians. And they had a strategic pact, even when Ukraine became independent in 1991, they have leases on their naval facilities in that Black Sea uh, ports on the Crimean Peninsula that are of huge strategic value and they're not gonna let them go. How can they have part of their Russian Navy, a big part of it, in a country that would join NATO? The other team, the other side, it could never happen. That's why the Ruskies are so pissed every time it, it comes up about Ukrainian membership in NATO. They're not gonna let that happen. Georgia, they've already invaded to kind of show you, hey, we're not gonna let that happen either. The Ukraine might be a tinderbox where a war could break out if the NATO membership keeps getting pushed. All right? Ha, ah, so now you know. Finally, what else may be going on with NATO? And this is another thing that a lot of strategists and military folks are starting to talk openly about. And I want you to be ahead of the curve as always. And that is you probably are going to live to see a uh, European Union slash NATO incorporation. It is extremely likely. Yes, you heard it here first that the EU military, now that there is an EU military that is strengthening and member states of the EU are more and more putting in more kind of a common stock into their military, a singular entity military for the whole European Union. Why should every single country have their military when they're all buddies in the EU? You might as well just have an EU army. That has been working and that has been going forward and that has been growing and there are already lots of leaders that have said, hey, guess what? Do the math here. All of the EU countries, or almost all of them, are NATO members. NATO is the most kick-ass military organization on earth. Why do we have two entities doing the same thing? I mean, think about it. Why do they? It seems like a lot of redundancy. So the EU military may indeed just get completely folded into the NATO command superstructure, and perhaps that's for the best for everybody. They already have the structure and the organizations in place. There's already sharing of knowledge and intelligence. That's something I actually have not even talked about in the whole NATO lecture. All of these countries are heavily sharing intelligence and planning and operations, and they are coordinating the military hardware that they make. And what's left? Why aren't they a singular whole already? That is increasingly being asked. France, just in current events, uh, was incorporated back into the NATO command structure. France, for decades, wanted to go its own way. It thought the U.S. had too much power in Europe, and so France was a NATO member, but they said, but, but we refuse to come to the meetings, and, you know, we'll help out when we have to help out, but we're not going to be, you know, sitting at the table planning shit with you. That changed. When Nicolas Sarkozy took power, he said, hey, not only do I want France to be more European, I want it to be more part of Team West, I want us to be a player, we're going to rejoin the table at NATO, and they did. At the same time what's happened just this year is France and the United Kingdom actually signing a 50-year military cooperation pact to essentially make a singular military service between the two countries. Wow! Crazy! I know! And again, that's just playing into these two European titans are making a singular military. The EU itself is building a singular military. NATO already oversees all this kind of anyway because they're all members of NATO. Just put them all together and that's probably what they're working to. Wow! Woo! That's gonna be it now. The most powerful kick-ass defense union ever will probably continue to grow, albeit in different ways, and affect world events for some time to come. More than ever before, NATO is looking great -o.